Okay, a very good evening to everyone. All right, good morning to everyone. Uh, good night. All right. So we are the, from the Astronomy Society of Penang in Malaysia, uh, presenting today's airport session, Astronomy Picture of the Day by NASA for April 2021. So three of us are in the, on, on the island of Penang, all right, in the northwestern corner of Malaysia, and one of uh, our member is in KL. Uh, KL, by the way, is Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. So I'm Dr. Chong, the president of the Society of, uh, of Astronomy Society of Penang, Mr. Lai Hong Jun, also our member, Okay, and then uh, Rayan, uh, which is from KL, KL. right? And then, uh, yeah, Sunit Singh, a schoolboy, just graduated from Chongming High School, and he's going to pursue his uh, studies later in uh, for his uh, university studies, all right? So this is for this uh, airport for this one. So I'll present the first picture now, April 2021. Right, can you see my picture? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so now. Street, I repeat, uh, 2021, April 24. And I see below here, Street and Prim from SpaceX Crew 2 launch. Oh, I remember. Just two hours ago, I was in Georgetown in Penang, and I saw uh, the, the Crew 2, uh, what do you call, uh, what do you call, capsule dot with the iss but this was a day earlier all right which was on friday uh malaysian time so they it was launched from uh florida in america and now it's just docked with this uh, uh iss so this was a launch so this is done by mr eric holland he's actually a landscape photographer he was just moving along the beach in in florida and he looked towards uh this place is of course the cape kennedy space flight center and you can see the Falcon 9 rocket being launched and in on, on the first stage, of course, it's a Crew 2 uh, capsule. And then you see here something very interesting. I'll play it twice. I play the first time without explanation. Then I'll explain it. Then I'll play a second time. Okay, now look carefully. I'll play it. I hope you can hear the music also. Now there's no music. Wow, what's it? Now the first one is, you see on the left, the, the Falcon 9 rocket was launched, going up, all right? And as you went up, so the, 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 the second stage will boost the, the capsule into space orbit, into orbit to, to, to chase the ISS to dock with it uh, later. But the, the first stage booster was reusable and you land back uh, intact on the Earth surface in Florida. So I play again. The launch, go up, and the first stage, land again so nice all right so basically our elon musk want to bring down the cost of space exploration to use the reusable rocket and then of course the the capsule itself has a name called endeavor and just dock with it and in this uh what they call crew two uh, capsule you have four astronauts one male american a female american a male japanese and a male frenchman all right so a lot of things uh, experiment will be done all right so later on the uh the crew one mission, uh, the capsule is also docked with this ISS. So right now there are two Dragon crew capsule docked with ISS. Crew one capsule, crew two capsule. So now crew two, crew two capsule brought four astronaut, and then it will bring down on the crew one uh, capsule another four astronaut which were in the ISS earlier. Remember, ISS have a ship work. This is not a ship work in the factory, yeah. Ship work in the International Space Station. So the time frame is usually six months. Every six months, there's a rotation of the crew, right? So this is a wonderful one because why this is called breaking news, right? Just occurred two hours ago, the crew two that was launched, docked successfully with the ISS. So the next one I'll present is 22nd of April. So this may look similar to what we saw uh, just now. I'll give more, more information. This is on the 20, 2021, April 22nd, Planet Earth and Twilight. So in the year 20, 2001, 20 years ago, uh, ISS Expedition 2, right, was launched from the from the, from Cape Kennedy to uh, the ISS. And at that time, there was uh, uh, astronauts, male and female. 
and when it, they were in space, they took this picture of the planet Earth. So you may say, what's so special? A lot of things are shown here. For example, I say that this is ISS Expedition 2 crew, and then this is by NASA. So you see here, there's a slow, the boundary between night on the left and day on the, on the right, it's not a sharp boundary, but slowly becoming brighter and brighter and brighter. That will be dawn. Or if from bright, on the right to the left, brighter become dimmer, 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 it's dusk. So this is a phenomenon of twilight. So it shows that uh, on the Earth, twilight doesn't occur instantaneously because the Earth has a thick atmosphere. Suppose we are on the moon, we are on uh, Mercury, where there's no atmosphere, there's no twilight. Suddenly day, day, daytime, su uh, suddenly night, all right, like this. So there you see beautiful, and here you see that we show that how precious we are, how precarious humanity is, where you have here a thin layer of the Earth's atmosphere, only about 100 kilometers. This is the Earth's atmosphere, all right? And here you see that below here, the cloud shell is red. So basically, the sun is on the left, the sunlight will enter the Earth's atmosphere on the left, and uh, the Earth, uh, what they call air molecules, oxygen and nitrogen, will scatter the light from the sun. It's called rarely scattering. So in the rarely scattering, the short they're playing, the blue is scattered out more. So as the light from the right enters to the Earth atmosphere, let's say this is the morning sky, morning sky. So as the sunlight passing through more and more of the Earth's atmosphere, parallel to the Earth's surface, more and more of the blue wavelength of the scattered out. So the light that continues to move from left to right is richer and richer in red. That's why it's a red. The clock clocks here are red, all right? So that's why we have a red sunset on the Earth and a red sunrise on the Earth because we are rarely scattering. But at the same time, if you go higher into the Earth's atmosphere, you see the scattered blue light. And this is the, uh, what do you call, the very scattering for the blue light. Like in daytime, you see the, what do you call, uh, above you, uh, the blue sky is because of very scattering. This scatters more of the blue light than the red light, all right? And a bit more technical is the power of the very scattering is the wavelength of light, not uh, uh, the reciprocal of the wavelength of light to the power of four. So if the wavelength is very, very short, the scattering is much more, right? So this is in 2001 from space, uh, ISS Expedition 2 crew looking down on the planet Earth. So beautiful, all right? Now we go to the next picture. 21st of April. Uh, this is very great. I think uh, last month also there was a similar picture, but not for this object. So it is for April 21st, Centaurus A, what magnetic field? So Centaurus A is a very strong source of uh, what they call uh, this uh, 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 radiation from Centaurus constellation. All right. So what the scientists have seen, maybe I can make it smaller here. You have here, here are these here. You have the, okay, the, the credit is the optical light, which is somewhere here, the white, the white one is from our uh, European Southern Observatory ESO, the white field imager. It's, uh, it's uh, in the telescope called, uh, what they call La Silla Observatory in Chile, belonging to European Southern Observatory. And in it, we have a white field imager, the, the image sensor, about 67 megapixels, and to all the white color part of this object, fantastic object. And then also the red part here is by about sub millimeter radio telescope by Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany. But the telescope is our Atacama Pathfinder Experiment Apex in Chile, but it's in sub millimeter wavelength. So the red one is what? Radio wavelength. Why do you mean sub millimeter? Because here in the disk of this, uh, two, this is two galaxies collision, in the disk, there's a lot of dust, you know? So if you use optical light by this, uh, what they call the ESO observatory, you can only see the part of the galaxy in the outer region. You cannot penetrate into the dust. So to penetrate into the dust cloud, you need sub-millimeter wave. Because sub-millimeter wave, the wavelength is longer than the particle of the, the, the size of the dust, so it can shine through. So you can see here, uh, use sub-millimeter wave for the, uh, what they call, Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, and then uh, later on also, you have this Chandra X-ray telescope also. So the blue is by Chandra X-ray telescope. So basically you have optical light, visible light, uh, infra, what do you call this, 
uh, short millimeter radio wave and also x-ray so these are three in one and oh oh what is this here so remember only last month which we showed picture just came this type of technology they are mapping sensitively the magnetic field of this galaxy you can see the fine detail so again they say how do they map it it's very simple so they use they call it polarization of optical light so remember in the disk of this galaxy a lot of dust uh, tiny grains of dust so when the light from the star falls on the dust and scatter off and remember in the gap in the, this galactic space there's a weak magnetic field usually all the galaxies in the universe, including Milky Way, has a weak magnetic field don't don't have the i think have that oh wow magnetic field very strong no 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 it's very big it's in the region of micro gauss say one micro gauss is 0 0.00001 gauss by zero followed by one so very weak for example earth's magnetic field on the surface is about half a gauss so the earth's magnetic field is 500,000 times stronger than the magnetic field here so what happens is when the optical light falls onto this dust particle and these dust, dust particles are embedded in the galactic magnetic field so as the light scatter off they are plane polarized so when so when the, this plane polarized light visible light scatter and come back to the earth there's a kind of analyzer so the the dust particle will polarize the the, the light but on the earth you have an analyzer to analyze the light so you know that this is so basically these are the according to the polarity of the magnetic field so on the outer parts of the region the magnetic field lines are more ordered but in the center very very disordered why because this is a collision of two galaxies so it seems when the two galaxies collide the magnetic fields are amplified here that means they increase so outside maybe the collision is not so violent so the magnetic field lines are very well arranged parallel to each other but in the center very violent collision so the magnetic field seems to be jumbled up scrambled up right so this is a really amazing picture right so this is our this so basically what do we what the scientists do like that so in a sense who knows maybe one of the eso scientists in france in uh, in germany is getting a phd doing a phd on this on, on this image all right you go to the next picture 18 now this one is interesting all right so this is our air rainbow air glow over azores so by miguel claro the miguel claro is one of the member from portugal of twan the world at night all right and of course the uh and rollover annotation means this uh this type of uh, what you call background animation done over by the american uh what you call image processor judy smith huh, from america miguel claro of course is from uh portugal so basically azores is a set of islands to the west coast of uh, uh portugal in the in the north atlantic ocean so you see beautiful wow so basically agro means that in the earth and even if you go to the darkest area of the world where no moon no no clouds no pollution there's not a single light uh caused by humanity on the earth surface the earth the sky will see a bit of glow so basically the there are all these cosmic ray particle or uh coming from outer space and they will excite the some of the the the, the molecules in the earth atmosphere and they will form say in this year they say it's oh radical right that means that zero H is a part of the uh, molecule of water so let's say you have a hydrogen combined with OH it will give up light so basically is the sum of the excited molecules and uh, atoms in the upper atmosphere get excited and they will recombine with other uh, radicals they will emit light for our human eye we don't see but equipment can detect so and you see and the thing is the light from this uh, uh what you call air glow have different colors and they follow a kind of wave form gravity wave this gravity wave is not gravitational wave it's not the earth's gravity nothing to do with gravity it's just that it caused by the fact that the the that's a seem like there's a band different band there's a wave in the pattern they just really give it a name uh what they call gravity wave so you see different constellation okay superimposed on this air glow right looking westward from uh from this azores island in the north atlantic ocean beautiful all right okay so we go next 16. okay so this is really great 
Et pour ceux qui disent, wow, vas-y. Et pour ceux qui disent, W Walk, World of Binary Black Hole, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Now remember, NASA has many, many organizations and research centers already. One of them is, of course, Goddard Space Flight Center. Goddard Space Flight Center is, of course, named after Professor Goddard, the American professor who first made liquid rock, fuel rocket, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen. All right? And this is a scientist, two scientists working in, we don't say Goddard Space Flight Center, we say NASA GSFC, right? Uh, Jeremy Shipman and Brian P. Powell, there are two scientists working in GSFC, and the text is by Francis Reddy, one of the uh, principal faculty specialists in NASA who wrote it. So once I see this, it gives me an idea. So just to give up, now, this picture of this black hole you must have seen in 2019. They saw the first image of a black hole in M87, but it was early year. Famous one, of course, earlier you know, lah. Uh -uh, interstellar. Remember, in interstellar, you see here on the right hand side, this picture of a black hole is not by itself, you know. In 1978, there was a French scientist called uh, Jean Pierre Lumilier. He did some uh, research on black hole and he did some simulation. And this is the famous picture of the black hole, 1978. And now it's accepted as true. So interstellar movie use, use his idea, all right? And later on, you have this thing now, all right? Was also based on Lumine. So what they do now, they base uh, the result of Lumine 1978, which simulated how a black hole should look like. And recently, 2019, they saw the black hole with confirming. So now this is what, this is called, ladies and gentlemen, numerical relativity. That means the scientists use Einstein field equation, for general relativity under strong field, not only strong many field, very, very strong many field, very, uh, black hole, and they simulate. So here you have the red one, which is the uh, uh, representing a black hole that has 200 million solar masses. And the blue one is another black hole, has 100 million solar masses. So as these two uh, black holes collide and, and, and uh, orbit around each other, the space and time geometry is weird, highly distorted. So please look and enjoy. That's some music also. Three minute simulation long. Okay, maybe I stop here. So basically, you may say, I don't believe in this simulation. You have to accept it's true, right? Because under extreme gravity, black hole, space and time is highly distorted. So if you are just outside these two black holes orbiting each other, this is how exactly space time will look like. Weird. Whereas if you see two normal stars, let's say a white dwarf star orbiting a red giant star, then the white dwarf space time and the red giant uh, space time will look the same. So you see two, two stars as itself orbiting around each other. But this is highly distorted because it's a black hole. It's true, all right? Two uh, supermassive black hole merging or orbiting around each other, all right? So now we go to the... Okay, so now I, I stop now. We have to wait for the next person, which is Ryan, all right? So Ryan, you're on for your picture. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, let me let me unshare first. Yes, Ryan, you on? 
Okay, let me present. Uh, hold on. Uh, yeah. Okay, wait. Something is. Hold yes. on. Is there any block on sharing, on presenting? No, I, I already, I already unshare already. So, Whoa. I don't see the screen. Yeah, it's not allowing me to share. Sunyin is not, not in also. Nobody's in. Something is wrong. Hold on. Something is wrong, huh? Any comment, huh, Michael? One moment. Okay, you're off the screen now. Okay, please enter again, All right, Ryan? Okay, you are joined yeah, again. Okay. Can you present? It still isn't allowing me. There is something that's blocking it. Yeah. Like any comment? Uh, Michael, any comment? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Sony, can you proceed with your, your side? All right. Uh, which is 6th of April. You're on, Sony? All right. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes, I see your screen now. All right. Okay, uh, Please so, present your airport picture. All right, so I'll present the airport for 6th of April first. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so this picture is taken by Christine Richer, which is a Canadian astrophotographer. Uh, please give and, the title of the picture, title. Yeah, we have the title of Mars and the Pleiades Beyond Vinegar Hill. All right, so Vinegar Hill is located at Nova Scotia, which is at Eastern Canada. And in this picture, we can see that there's a lonely tree uh, separating Mars to the left and Pleiades to the right. So this picture is actually taken during the conjunction of Mars and Pleiades, which is on the 4th of March this year. And so Christine, she took about several hours to compose this picture so she actually took about 80 frames of this picture and used 28 usable frames so they uh she composed all the 28 frames to produce this picture that we're looking at right now and for your information mars and pleiades over here in in the screen they have a angular distance about 2.5 degrees apart so this is actually very close and it will not this it will not be this close until 17 years from now which is in the year 20 and 38 and so you can actually also see the star atlas over here which is a star in the constellation of taurus and Pleiades, the seven sisters mm -hmm. or with the uh, seven very bright stars and very hot stars mm -hmm. all right so uh I'll move on to the next picture. Yes. Oh, oh, it's all here, sorry. Okay. So this is the airport for 4th of April. And this picture is taken taken by the Cassini imaging team. The, ISS... the title of the picture, the title. Oh, okay. Uh the title is In True Beyond Saturn's Ring. So we can see that there's a part of Saturn's outer ring over here and some moons 
So this picture is taken by the Cassini Imaging Team, the ISS International Space Station, the JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the ESA uh, European Space Agency, and NASA. So in this picture, you can see that there's four moons of Saturn and the rings of Saturn. So, uh, this is the ring A, uh, ring A, ring F, and the most outermost ring, which is the ring G and ring E. So we can see there's a very big moon over here, which is Titan at the background of this picture. And then second, we have this moon on the foreground of this picture, which is Dion. And then the third moon is this little dot over here, which is a moon called Pandora with a diameter about 83 kilometers wide. So uh, to visual, I'll let you see the moon. This is just an illustration of the moon. So it's not really uh, spherical. And yeah, this is what it looks like. And for the fourth moon is this tiny little dot over here. And this moon is called Pan. So Pan is also a very small moon that has a, a diameter of about 35 kilometers. And this moon is also quite interesting because the shape of this moon is like a walnut as you can see over here, all right? So actually Pan, this moon, it functions as a shepherd moon. So what's a shepherd moon? It's actually that a moon that clears a gap between the rings of, uh, a, planetary, uh, of a planet so that all the particles in the ring will stay inside a ring and will not uh, scatter around, okay? So actually, this, taken, uh, this picture is taken by the Cassini spacecraft. So uh, as we all know that Cassini spacecraft actually died about four years ago. So Cassini, this, uh, the spacecraft actually died by uh, NASA actually purposely want Cassini to crash into the atmosphere of Saturn. So why did NASA want to do this move? Why did NASA want to destroy a spacecraft that worth about two million uh, two billion dollars so there's actually a good reason behind this that it's because uh if nasa let cassini spacecraft to keep orbiting around saturn then there's a possibility that the spacecraft might collide with the moons of saturn and nasa wanted to avoid this because in the future nasa have already uh starting to plan some projects to build some spacecraft to travel to the uh, moon of Saturn, which is Titan. And the spacecraft has the name with, uh, I think the name is called Dragonfly. So NASA wants to send this spacecraft Dragonfly to Titan to search for some signs of life. So in order to keep the uh, Titan, uh, keep the moons of Saturn unpolluted, NASA didn't want Cassini that's carrying the fuel to crash into the moon. So instead, NASA want Cassini to enter the Saturn's atmosphere and eventually the spacecraft will burn and melt. So this is all for this uh, picture. Moving on to the next picture. Uh, oh, here. Okay. So this is a, a port for 2nd of April. So in this picture, uh, it has a title of NGC 3521 Galaxy in a Bubble. So NGV, uh, NGC 3521 is a galaxy in the new general catalog. All right. So this picture is uh, captured by Eric Benson, which is a South Australian uh, astrophotographer. And the picture was processed by Dietmar Hager, which is a astrophotographer from Austria. Okay. So in this picture, we can see that that's a galaxy and it looks like this galaxy was inside a bubble. So why is what this thing, why is uh, this thing, uh, this galaxy is so blurry? What is this all blurry stuff within uh, embedding the galaxy? So it's actually that before this, uh, the galaxy may have already collided with other galaxies. And so both this galaxy merged with merge to each other and to produce the galaxy that we're actually looking right now. And all these blurry things are the debris that were produced during the merging of both the galaxies. 
All right. So for this galaxy, we can see there's some blue colors and some pink colors over here. So all the blue colors are actually the hot stars that is uh, orbiting around the galaxy. And the pink color over here is all the excited hydrogen gas. OK, so about this galaxy, uh, it this galaxy has a distance about uh, 35 million light years away from us. And the size of this galaxy is about 50,000 light years in diameter, which means that's about uh, half the diameter of Milky Way galaxy. And this galaxy doesn't get uh, much, uh, didn't draw much of attention for uh, amateur astrophotographers because this galaxy is actually located in the constellation of Leo, and you know that Leo they have a they have the uh, galaxies called the Leo triplet, which uh, we can also call it the M sixty five, M sixty six, or the Hamburger galaxy. So this uh, this three galaxy draws a lot of attention. So to the uh, astrophotographers. So most of the astrophotographers like to observe those galaxies, but not this galaxy. So this galaxy, we can, uh, we can see that, OK, during this capturing of this picture, we can see that the stars back uh, at the background over here has a, a four diffraction spikes, So which, which means that uh, Eric, the astrophotographer, is using a reflector telescope to capture this image and for the reflector telescope it has a four metal rods holding the secondary mirror for the reflector telescope so when we see the image uh the when we see this picture you can see the stars have four diffraction spikes and yeah so that's it for me okay okay Ryan, it's yours the floor is yours okay I'm going to present. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes now. No. OK. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chong. Uh, I will now move on to uh, my section uh, in the APOD. My name is Rayan. I am 13 years old. And I'll be presenting three APODs for today, uh, the first of which will be the APOD for April the 15th. Its name is The Galaxy the jet, and a famous black hole. Uh, now, this photograph, credits are given to three different uh, organizations, so to say. You've got NASA, uh, of which JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is under. And JPL is actually located in Pasadena's California Institute of Technology, a university, uh, a university located in California itself. And they are responsible uh, for the Spitzer Space Telescope, which can be seen right here. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope. And this telescope took the main big photograph that you see here. Uh, these areas, these boxes are just zooming in. Uh, so you've got a couple of stars, galaxies. Uh, but what's most important is this is what's here over here. That's the Galaxy M87, Messier 87, part of the Messier catalog. Now, before we move on, I would also like to, uh, to mention the credits given to the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. They are responsible for the smaller photograph of a black hole that we have in the image there. I'm going to move over, over. I'm going to move over here so that you can see. Uh, this is the photograph itself. What's of most importance right now is the is this galaxy. Oh wait, let me change my color. Is this galaxy this part? This is, as I said, Messier 87. Now, if we were to zoom in and look into this box specifically, we have what is referred to as a relativistic jet. Now, we'll explain why it's called that in a moment. But basically, what it is is matter being ejected out. And in 1999, when the Hubble Space Telescope took a photograph of it, scientists measured its speed to be around four to six times the speed of light, which for those Star Trek fans, it would be warp one, warp two. But wait a minute, that can't be right. We're not living in the Star Trek world. Nothing can go faster than light relative to space. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is an example of superluminal motion, or basically faster than light movement. Uh, now, it occurs, 
it, it usually occurs when an object is approaching you. You see, when something approaches you, the amount of time that light takes uh, to travel from it to you shortens. As a result, when you talk about range of 50 to 60 million light years, and you go at, uh, say, near the speed of light, which is actually a reason why it's called relativistic jet, when you go at that speed, you get superluminal motion. It appears. It is apparently going faster than light. So that's basically what it is here. Uh, now, the source of this is this little piece over here, which, when zoomed out, we see to be the galaxy M87 and the asterisk. So that refers to this black hole over here. Now, this photograph is a historic photograph. It was released in April, uh, well, actually, yes, April. It was released two years ago, exactly in April of 2019, when the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration took a photograph of the first, well, captured the first ever image of a black hole. Uh, now, Dr. Kevin Quay, who is actually from Penang, was part of that team. And this image, it is, as I said, the first to ever capture a black hole. It, so it captured the shadow, and it was an array of about eight radio telescopes all around the world that put this together. Now, Dr. Chong actually mentioned in a previous APOD uh, using polarization to capture magnetic fields, where they recently applied this method onto the picture, and we learned more about it. You see, we don't exactly know how, it, how the matter is ejected out of it, but we, we hope that with new data coming in, we may finally solve the mystery. Now, with that, I move on to my next APOD. That APOD is for April the 14th. Its name is the Penso Nebula Supernova Shockwave, taken by Mr. Greg Turgeon and, Uk and Mr. Ukarsh Mishra. Uh, now, Mr. Mishra is a law student from India, uh, who, who is from India in uh, Lucknow, and Mr. Turgeon is an American dentist. Now, they both have uh, interest in astronomy, and they took this photograph that we have over here. Now, this photograph, it's of NGC 2736, uh, three, two, seven, three, yes, 2736. Uh, uh, NGC represents the new general catalog, and this uh, nebula is also known as the Penso Nebula, part of the Vila Supernova remnant. Now, it is understood that 11,000 to 12,300 years ago, the supernova in the Vila constellation exploded, and from there, the remnants, the pieces of matter that were ejected out of it were moving at speeds of millions of kilometers per hour. But as time went, this, what is, uh, what is now the Penso Nebula, has started to slow down. And the speeds are now about 644,000 kilometers per hour. But don't get me wrong, this is still fast. It is about Mark 500 and is almost three times faster than the average Formula One car. Now, this photograph uses a different color mapping uh, than the Hubble Space Telescope photographs in that it matches hydro uh, ionized hydrogen to the red, red portions and oxygen to the blue. Now, that would be it for this photograph. We now move on to what is my favorite of the three. Now, this one looks very, it looks rather dull. It's, it's just a piece of equipment somewhere. But let's explain what it is. First of all, it's named the Confirmed Muon Wobble Remains Unexplained. Yes, unexplained. This photograph is just an example to show that, you see, an experiment was done. And this experiment might prove that there may be new physics that we did not know of before. Damn, Wait, that's can you please give the title of this picture? Title. Uh, yes, the Confirmed Muon Wobble Remains Unexplained. And, and this photograph, it was taken at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory by their house photographer, Radar Han. And what it is, is of an experiment, an experiment called the Muon G2. Now, to understand this experiment, let me go back over here. To understand how this experiment works, we're going to have to go back to the, to the 1970s. But before we do that, I would like to first capture its essence. The essence of this is that we ran an experiment and certain values that were, that were calculated, that we have previously calculated, did not match what the experiment gave. 
Now in science, whenever something doesn't match, either your equipment is faulty or you did a miscalculation somewhere, or there is a new discovery lying there. And there's a very high chance that there actually is a new discovery. Allow me to explain. In the 1970s, okay, in the 1970s, scientists came up with what is referred to as the standard model for particle physics. Uh, let me see whether I can get a photograph of that. The standard model of particle physics has all the fundamental particles that we know of now. So this is basically what it is. Now, there is also the antiparticles, but what is important is that uh, a lot of your a lot of your familiar particles would be here, such as the electron and the photon. Now, both of them fall under different categories. Uh, electrons are fermions, while photons are bosons. Now, if you were to break down the fermion uh, the fermion family, you would actually get two subgroups, two subfamilies. Um, one of them is called the leptons. That is where the electron exists. The other ones, the quarks, those make up another majority of matter. Now, in the lepton family, there are six particles, or 12 if you include their antiparticle partners. You've got the electron, the muon, the tau, and the respective neutrinos. So you know what the electron is, but do you know what the muon is? Well, the muon is almost identical to the electron, except that for some reason it's 200 times heavier, and hence decays at a faster rate, leaving it with a lifetime of about 2.2 microseconds, which is very short. Now, the muon, similar to the electron, has a magnetic property where if you were to put it in a strong enough magnetic field, it wobbles all the way like a spinning top. Now, just like a spinning top, it also has a precession. In other words, after a while, it will start, it will start to slowly wobble until it doesn't spin anymore. Now, the muon has a similar thing. And to calculate how much wobble a muon has, we use a term called the G factor. Now, the famous uh, English theoretical physicist, Paul Dirac, he, using his equations, he calculated that the G factor of the muon should be around two. But unfortunately, due to the weirdness of quantum physics, it doesn't exactly match precisely two. Uh, there is a certain value called the anomalous magnetic moment, and that causes it to differ very slightly from two. So those quantities are what the uh, what the experiments done here at Fermilab, it's the short form for Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, are trying to calculate. So now that we understand the G factor, let's move on to this experiment itself. Now, this experiment actually started, it, it, this is a successor to a previous one done in the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. It, it ended in 2001. And let me just share with you what the results were. Uh, you see, at that time, the G factor was calculated to be two. Wait, let me let me move in here. The G factor of that time was calculated to be two point zero zero two three three one eight three six. But what they what they achieved from their experiment was an answer that was rather different. It was two point zero zero two three three. Let me get this right. 1842. So just that small difference hinted at scientists and they thought, hey, maybe there's a discovery here, but we can't be, for, we can't be sure because we're going to need more precise equipment. So what did they do? Well, this is what they did. They took this entire magnet that they have here. This thing is 17 tons and they moved it all the way from Brookhaven to Illinois where Fermilab was. Uh, so basically, they put it on a barge. It had to go through. It had to go via sea, and as you can see here, it made its way all the way around the or all the way around Florida, up the Mississippi River, and then to Illinois. Now it should get clear in a moment. That was the entire path it took. This right here. Uh, so yes, they had to be sure that nothing happened to it. Now, once it arrived in Fermilab, it took them about four years to get it prepared. Over those four years, they increased the accuracy, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, in May of 2017, this photograph was taken and muons were first sent through this particle accelerator, which generates higher intensity beams. Now, it was then in uh, this, uh, it was then this year, in April of 2020, that the results of their first run came in. 
Now, in June of 2020, about 170 scientists came together and got a new theoretical value. Their theoretical value was, let me make sure I get this correct, uh, this, the theoretical value was 2.00233318320. But what they found in the experiment was the exact same thing over here for the first few digits, but it changed right at the last four digits. Now, the chances that this is a statistical error is one in 40,000. And Fermilab hopes to get better accuracy in, uh, in the future. They plan to run five total tests until 2022. Um, the first one has already been analyzed. The second and the third are being analyzed. The fourth is ongoing and the fifth is planned for the future. So we hope that with greater accuracy, we can finally understand what happened, what actually happened here. And a scientist set a standard of five sigma. At that point, we can consider it a discovery. It's just a statistical number. Uh, this experiment here, we have already gotten 4.2 sigma. So with luck, we may be able to get five sigma. And we would have discovered that there's a new particle, a new force currently unaccounted for in the standard model of particle physics. So to anyone watching here, if you have an idea of why this happened, well, a Nobel Prize might be heading your way. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be it for my photographs. Uh, my name is Rayan. Thank you, and may the science be with you. Okay. Thank you, Rayan. Thank you, Rayan. So, Lai, allow oh, me to present for April 7th, huh? Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Oh, oh. Can you see my screen, huh, Lai? Can you see my yes. screen? Yes, yes. Okay, so now this is it. So this is April the 7th, 2021. So this is for the trace of NGC 1947. NGC means new general catalog. New general catalog doesn't mean it was invented yesterday. No, it was actually invented in the 19th century, more than 100 years ago. But they still call it new general catalog. Entry number 1947 is this uh, galaxy, right? So this is a galaxy, which is a merger of a big galaxy with another smaller galaxy uh, also. So this is by ESA, European Space Agency, Hubble, and uh, NASA. And one of the scientists is D. Rosario. The acknowledgement here is by an amateur scientist called, uh, called uh, Leon Schatz, all right? So now basically it's in the constellation of Dorado. Now what happened is, what is exciting, uh, interesting about this picture? There you are, this trace. So basically you know that in the Milky Way galaxy, from planet Earth, you look at the constellation of Sagittarius at night, dark sky, you find that there's a dark lane in the center of the Milky Way. But the dark lane in the center of the Milky Way is very thick and very continuous. But these dark lanes are like very thin trace on me. So after some uh, research, the astronomers found that actually this, this gigantic uh, 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 galaxy is rotating and it's rotating with the stars and stars in it. But this trace here, what is this trace? That means in between the interstellar space, there are dust particles. Dust particle means what? The dust on the floor in the room just staying on. Silicate, the dust particle. So in between the stars, there are a lot of dust. And because we are very far away from it, so it's as if you concentrate a lot of space into a small volume, and it looks like it's very, very dim. But actually, if you go into the center of this dust cloud, there's practically empty space vacuum, right? But because far away, it looks like very thick. So you follow that this trace of uh, what is called dust huh, do not rotate in the same speed as the stars that are orbiting the galaxy. And then they found the conclusion that this trace of dust clouds actually came from a smaller galaxy that collided and was cannibalized and eaten up by this big galaxy. And we meaning leaving behind this trace of dust that are rotating around the center of the galaxy at a different speed compared to the other stars that are rotating in that galaxy. And that's what's interesting. And again, you see this star here, like what Sunni uh, explained earlier, four spikes. Right? This is a red, bright uh, star. This is a bright, uh, white star. Four spikes, meaning that the uh, secondary mirror of that telescope, they never mentioned much, or there is Hubble. All right? Remember, Hubble is a 2.4 meter Vichy Creighton telescope. And Hubble's uh, spider that holds the second mirror also got four veins. That's why you have four deflection spikes. So all these stars are the stars inside the Milky Way. 
Of course, there are a lot of other stars here, are also the stars in Milky Way. But because they are too, not too bright enough, not so bright, so they actually have a deflection spike, all of them, but too small to be seen. Only the bright stars have deflection spikes, right? So that's for, for me, uh, lie your own. Yes. So let's proceed to this one, 12th of April. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Lai. As usual, you see me every month for the report session. So yes, let's start with 12th of April. So before we proceed on 12th of April, just a, a small reminder to all of our audience. If you all have any questions, you are welcome to comment it in the comment section, either in the YouTube or in the Facebook channel. So now let's start with this 12th of April. So 12th of April, right? So we have this uh, image or this a pod from Team Arrow, Arrow, okay, which is uh, this one, the Astro Alentejo, sorry, Astro Alentejo Remote Observatory. It's a remote observatory located in southern Portugal, so it's somewhere here, the red pin over here, right? So this is a image of a flame nebula and Alnita, okay, Alnita. So this flame nebula is also known as NGC, the New General Catalog 2024. Okay, and this is an emission nebula. What is an emission nebula? An emission nebula is actually a nebula form of ionized gas that emits light of various wavelengths. But the source of the emission, okay, the source of emission is actually from high energy photon, uh, sorry, high energy UV photons from nearby hot stars. So in this case, right, as mentioned in the caption below over here, okay, the bright stars, okay, which is this Almita, shines the very high energy UV and provides, uh, causing this nebula to glow. So this is called a flame nebula because it's very, uh, you can see it very simple. It's very direct. It looks like, it looks like a flame. So it's called a flame nebula. Right. And this flame nebula is actually uh, a member of this, we call it Orion Molecular Cups Complex, or we call it the Orion Complex. For the Orion Complex, there are two parts, okay? There's this Orion Complex A and A, which is consists of the Orion Nebula, and the Orion, Orion B, which up here, we have uh, uh, the flame nebula over here, and the horsehead nebula, which is this one, the famous horsehead nebula, okay? so. Also, we have in this image is the Alnita. Alnita is a leftmost or the westmost stars on the Orion's belt. So we are familiar with the Orion belt. Okay, so we have Alnita, Alnila, and Mitaka. So Alnita is over here. It's the leftmost or the westmost. All right. And Alnita is actually a three, uh, a three triple star system, right? Triple star system. And just a little bit more information is for this uh, flame nebula at the center, right? At the center, uh, it's actually there yeah, are stars forming region with stellar ages ranging to 12 million years. So there are many stars are forming over here. And this is actually proven by this uh, Chandra X-ray micro uh, Chandra X-ray microscope. Sorry, not microscope, telescope, Chandra X-ray telescope. <laughs> okay, so this is about it for 12th of April. Next, we proceed to 10th of April. So, is the uh, title is Zodical Night, okay? And it's a landscape with the night sky, uh, image taken by John Francois Dauphin, okay? He's a French astrophotographer. Where is it? This one is taken in southern France, uh, the place called uh, Pirini, Pirini, okay? And it's taken on the mount, okay, it's on the mountain called Mount Valier. Okay, Valier, uh, at an altitude of around 2,300 meters. Right. Sorry, 2,800 meters. So over here we can see the night sky. Okay, we have the nice landscape. Okay, and then we have the night sky. We have the Milky Way. We have the zodiacal light. We have Milky Way. We have zodiacal light. We have Orion. We have Taurus. 
Okay, so Milky Way, zodiacal light. So a little bit information for this zodiacal light is, uh, we also call this zodiacal light as false dawn. Okay, it's actually a face, uh, sorry, a faint, diffuse and roughly triangular white light, right? Uh, triangular shape. So this is the zodiacal light that is visible in the night sky. So the best time is after sunset or just before sunrise. This is the best time for for viewing the zodiacal light. But then because it's very faint, so if you have a full moon or you have uh, this uh, light pollution, then you might not be able to see this because it's very faint and it's very sensitive to uh, we, we need a very dark sky to observe this. So the Milky Way, and then over here we have the Orion, all right, like this one is the Onita, as we mentioned just now. So Betelgeuse is here, Betelgeuse. So as the Orion belt from where east to west, sorry, all right, pointing, pointing from west to east over here, this one is Aldebaran. Okay, Aldebaran is in the constellation of Taurus, and up here, just right below the arc of this Milky Way, we have Mars. So it forms a triangle. The three red stars in the sky forms a triangle. So this is the cool part of this image or this photo. All right, so next let's proceed to the last airport, which is uh, 1st of April. Uh, this is a video. For this month, uh, our airport have a lot of videos. If you are interested, you can have a look, all right, on a lot of videos, a lot of nice videos. So these videos is actually taken, okay, Video credit by NASA and also this this stuff. Uh, before before we play, all right. So brief information about this video is this video is taken from ISS. So having a chance to look at this rocket launch live from the launch pad from the launch site, uh, I think we have seen a lot of this live session. It's interesting. It's exciting, but. Very rare we have the chance to see the uh, see the launching from from the sky or or, or from outside the earth from, in, from the space. So this video shows us rocket launch. So the mission is actually um it uh, happened. The launch is actually on November twenty eighteen, which is three years back. Uh, they sending this Progress MS ten, which is actually sending supplies to the ISS. Because you know ISS up there, our astronauts living up there, we need food, okay? we need water, we need fuel to maintain the ISS, to maintain, uh, to make sure ISS is in orbit. So we need fuel, we need supply, all right? So every, about every three to four months, okay, maximum four months, okay, but usually three months, the Russian will send the supply to the ISS. So last time, Okay, before before this uh, space shuttle retired, when space shuttle is still in service, so the Russian Soyuz will send the supply, and then the space shuttle will send the crew, will send the American astronauts, and then the Soyuz will send uh, the Russian cosmonauts. But since after 2011, when the last flight of space shuttle, so after that, uh, space shuttle retired, okay, uh, is out of service, no longer in service, and then all the mission to ISS is actually run by this uh, Russian, by Soyuz, sent by Soyuz. Until I think 2019 or 20, 2020 last year, when SpaceX successfully sent the astronauts to ISS. So American is now, uh, they have their rocket, they have the launch back to, back to ISS again. So for about eight to nine years, uh, Americans have Depending is depending on uh, Russian for the launch to ISS. So now uh, let's see this video. Let's enjoy this video. So you can see the, the launch is from Baikonur. Okay, so the launch start here. Okay, then launch and Soyuz is a three stage rocket. So consists of four boosters. The four boosters they consider it as a first stage, different from the Chinese. Okay, uh, the Chinese usually the boosters they consider that as a half stage, but the Russian consider it as a one two stage. So launch, okay, then you can see the re-entry of the main stage. 
So here is it. Okay, so the call state free entry over here, you can see. Here, yeah, the entry. So it's a very bright, it's like meteor, but it's not meteor. Right? So not necessary, you see something bright flying over the sky is a meteor. Sometimes it can be space debris or re entry of some spacecraft. Okay? And then the main core is over here. So usually it takes one to two days to dock, to dock with this ISS. All right. Doesn't mean that once you launch, immediately you can launch, you can dock with this ISS. All right. It takes it take, it take time, sorry. So the main the main spacecraft. Alright. Let, let, let's replay again. So the main spacecraft, okay, will orbit around the Earth first, all right? And slowly chasing up the ISS before it can dock. Okay. So this is it about it. Okay, we, we watch this again and then before the video ends. Uh, if any questions, let's see. Yeah, Michael, like any question for us? No, uh, from the Facebook site, I don't see any. So just a little bit of information is this ISS is actually in this low Earth orbit. All right, so it's very near to Earth. It is approximately 200 kilometers from Earth, so it's not far away. Okay, but it still needs some time. Okay, doesn't mean that 15 minutes you launch from Earth, you can reach ISS. <laughs> Even the rocket is traveling very fast. Okay, and yeah, just to mention this video is actually a 15 minutes time lapse, and they compress it into 90 seconds, which is one and a half minutes. Okay. So it's actually the whole process is 15 minutes. Okay. Any question uh, live from YouTube? No. Yeah. So I think that's it from me. Thank you very much. And so like I think if, can, what's coming up and in the coming month? What's on next month? You can stop here for the airport session. So once again, we thank you, Ray Yen. Sunit and Dr. Chong for the airport session tonight and we thanks all of our audience. So before we end our session, so feel free to join us, uh, Astronomi sorry, Astronomical Society of Penang. Follow our Facebook, Instagram, or subscribe our YouTube channel. So for upcoming event we're having in May, which is 15th of May, we will have the Astro Cafe session, which discuss on, which is an introduction session of all of the observatories, all of these astronomical observatories we have in Malaysia. And then on the 29th of May, uh, we will have the next airport session, as our airport session is usually held in the last week of every month, the last Saturday of every month, sorry. And also on the 22nd of May, we will have an interview session with a Malaysian professional astronomer or amateur astronomer uh, who, will be, who will be the person we interview. Uh, stay tuned and follow our Facebook, Instagram or subscribe our YouTube channel. So once again, thank you everyone. Have a good night. Enjoy. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. okay, so may I answer? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, assuming that you're referring to that additional change in the original G factor of two, uh, they are caused by uh, virtual particles um, because in quantum mechanics, particles are allowed to appear out of nowhere and then disappear. So those particles popping up here and there, they are what cause that fluctuation from the from the exact value of two. Hmm. Uh, question, Michael, any more question? Okay. All right. So we end the, end the session tonight. Uh, thanks everyone. Huh? Thanks to Rayan, Sunit, Lai again. See you again, our next, next session, 29th of May.